All right. So one of the things that I think is interesting is um, in the postmodern era, I find that so few students actually know most of the cultural references that they should. He brings up several. One of them is Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. There is a new um, series version of Brave New World you can watch. Brave New World is what we call a um, dark utopian or dystopian novel. You'll hear references to these all the time. Uh, when I was growing up in high school, you were required to read some of the dystopian novels, particularly 1984. Students now tell me that they've never read 1984 or heard of 1984. It's a cultural reference, which you should, should be aware of. Um, it was required reading. I've asked students what they read in high school now. I've had students tell me that in their English classes in high school, they read Jackie Collins novels in American history. There's a couple of things wrong with that. A, they're trash, and B, she wasn't even an American. She was, she's British. So. Uh, you should watch or know what these are, these dystopians, 1984, Brave New World, Fahrenheit 451. And again, you can watch Brave New World on Peacock for free. There's a series. It's pretty good. It stars, one of the stars in it is Demi Moore. Um, and it does a pretty good job of updating sort of the book, staying true to the book, but, but really using what we can use in terms of modern technology to make that aware. So how do we know that this um, video is really, really old? I mean, by really, really old, really, really old in terms of the internet and our ability to utilize the internet and find out things uh, is like, like last year is really, is really old. But this is really old. We already have facial recognition on our phones. What else? So that's one. There's a big one in there. There's way more social media. Than There's way more social media than what he talks about. It's not just Facebook, although it's Facebook is still the largest. Really? Yeah, it's still the largest social media platform, I think. I think if Facebook were a nation, it would be something like the fifth or sixth largest nation in the world in terms of users. I thought our generation was most free out of that. <laughs> because you're not on Facebook? Why would you be on Facebook? Your parents are on Facebook. That means it's not cool anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why would you be there? The big one, the big giveaway in that is he talks about Google Glasses. I really thought Google Glasses would be something that would really take off. They didn't like it was a it was a huge failure. I think they should have rebranded them and they start should have started issuing them to police departments to use instead of body cameras because it would be a lot cheaper. Body cameras. I used to be Vice Mayor and Guthrie and body cameras are, are enormously expensive. There's only one company that really manufactures them. I thought, hey, Google Cloud, that's cheap and you can do it and get all the data, you know. And that way you'd actually have a live view of what the officer is actually looking at when he shoots rather than the body camera, which sits right here. And it's hard, to, I mean, you don't really know, um, you know, particularly like most people take a stance and shoot like this, which means that the camera is actually off um, target. Whereas if you had Google Glass, they would be right on target, right? So the baby question that he, he asked about showing the woman, would you be likely to hire? How many hours are there and as business students, you should know this. How many hours are there in a work year? So this one works, great. How many weeks are there in a year? There are 52. So if you multiply 52 times the average work week in the United States, for most people, not lawyers, but for most people is, what's the standard work week? 40, 40 hours. So if you multiply 52 times 40, I believe you get 2080. Is that correct? Did I do my math correct? All right. So since you came up with 52, 52 times 40, 2080. If you take that the average American gets at most jobs two weeks of vacation a year, which is 80 hours. So we subtract 80 hours and you're left with 2,000 hours. In my first profession, the legal profession, law firms in Oklahoma City, this is no longer true. They now want you to bill 2,100 hours a year in most of the big firms in law. But when I was graduating from law school, they wanted you to bill 1,900 hours a year, right? So what does that leave over? That leaves 100 hours. To bill 1,900 hours, you have to work 75 to 80 hours a week. 
historically, women who had babies didn't make partner in law firms because it's just an objective fact. If you are not billing 1,900 hours and they now want you to bill 2,100 hours, which is over the 2080, and I have a, a colleague who is an attorney at a big firm in, in Tulsa, he bills out something like 2,700 hours a year. And I'm like, James, that's unethical. What are you doing? How are you doing? Like, are you literally like when you go to the bathroom billing mm -hmm. people? For, and he's like, yeah. It's like, if I think about there, if you watch a film called The Firm, um, Gene Hackman tells Tom Cruise's character, if you so much as think about them, bill them for a tenth of an hour. If you're, if you're sitting at the dinner table and you think about a client, you bill. So women, historically, so, you know, law firms do this. If, if they see that you have kids, or, I mean, there was, in, in big law firms, there was historically a partner track for women and a mommy track for women. This didn't apply to men, right? Because men generally aren't the ones that are called from the school when the kid has, I mean, historically speaking, they are now. But they, they historically, even if women worked, and they, they made as much as their husbands. My mother made more than both of her. She married the two most worthless men on the planet, made a lot more money than either of them. And, uh, and they were both federal agents, by the way. My stepfather was a, was a special agent in charge of the FBI's field office in Santa Fe, New Mexico. But my mother owned a real estate company. But, you know, who did the school call? They called my mother when, we, when my brother and I were. They didn't call my dad or my stepfather. They called her. And she's the one that went and got us, right? So we have this enormously, aren't you in the wrong class again? I think this is the right class, unfortunately. You think this is the right class? Yes. What were you supposed to be in? Marketing ethics. No, marketing ethics is on Tuesdays. What? It's a blended class. So there's one day that we meet class and then there's one day that we, it's online. So this is integrated marketing communication. Okay. So marketing ethics is on Tuesday at 9.30. Just Tuesday. Just Tuesday. Not right. Thursday. Okay, we'll see you Tuesday. All right. Um, so there's this there's this problem that we have. You know, people can now, in the past, you could hide that maybe. You could tell them you, you didn't have kids. They're not supposed to ask those questions, but they do. It comes out, right? I mean, they figure it out. But now they can absolutely figure it out. He also talks about something called nudging and rigging the game. What is nudging? Anybody know what nudging is? Is that like saying like how much you can get away with like little by little? Not exactly. Nudging is when we modify environments and the way he modified it there was they were going to, they're going to disclose how we're going to use your answers, but we disclose and then we wait 15 seconds and then ask you the series of questions and whether or not you would consent to letting faculty see that's, that's nudging, right? And, in Marketing, we've done a lot of studies, and now there's a guy, his name was Brian Wansink. He became very famous as a branding scholar. Turns out a lot of his research was, was rigged, and so he lost a, a bunch of his publications have been pulled from the shelves. But one of the things that he did as a branding scholar and, and looked at was food branding and how to get people to engage in healthier eating. And so he came up with a whole lot of recommendations that were followed. He had National Institutes of Health um, research that was done on this, and they, they did this. So one of the ways that you can nudge people in eating is by providing just small, according to his research, which has now largely been questioned, rather than going, if you go to an all-you-can-eat buffet, they used to give you these huge plates or platters, and people would fill up, and they would give you a tray at these buffets. If you want to, if you all are too young to remember this, there was places called like Furs Cafeteria, and you'd, you'd get a tray, and you would load up the tray, well, you can nudge people to eat less by taking away the tray. They've now done this at college campuses across the country. You have a meal plan at a college campus. It includes going to the cafeteria. When I was at OU, a student and undergraduate, I, I had a meal plan that required, you had to have your freshman year, you had to live in the dorms, and you had to have a meal plan, and you had to have at least like something like 14 meals a week that you ate. So we would go, you know, I was a, a young, um, you know, my metabolism was, was, off the charts and I could eat anything that I want. We'd go over to the cafeteria um, that was across from Walker Tower, which is where I lived, and we would load up on food, right? Colleges, as a result of Brian Wansink's research, started taking away the trays. So you can still have as much food and using smaller plates. 
you can still have as much food as you want, but we nudge you to not, right? If you, if you get the tray, you're going to fill it up. If you don't get the tray, what happens? Well, you can only carry two things at a time. You can only carry a plate and a drink or two plates. So you go through, you get, you know, one meal and then you get your drink and you go sit down and you're less likely to go back because it takes time. And one of the things that happens with eating is that the faster you eat, the more you can eat. It takes your body some time for the stomach to send messages to your brain that says, I'm full. And that's how these people who are like little skinny guys do these. Have you ever seen these hot dog eating contests that they have on television? They do it on the Food Network all the time. It's really, really disgusting. And like the people, the winners of them, you think like big boy who's 400 pounds is going to be the winner, right? No, it's always like some skinny kid who just can wolf down. Now, they usually go throw up instantly after these contests. But it's just a matter of getting it as fast as you can down. And it takes your brain some time to, to catch up to the idea that you are actually full. Well, if you take away the tray and somebody goes and they get like the salad course first, sit down and eat that. By the time you finish eating it and get up to go get more food, your body has already started to say, I'm getting full. That's nudging. Now, we might think that that's a good thing, that this nudging is a good thing, right? I don't know. It's highly ethically suspect because you're basically manipulating people to do what you want without them realizing it and without telling them. That, that generally leads to problems from an ethical perspective. So the history of the internet. It started in the 1960s in the United States for government research. There were very few people who actually had access and they, they in the 1960s, they didn't even have really access to it. At that point in time, they were working on various projects. So, uh, my grandfather worked on the Manhattan Project. For those of you who know what that is, that was the building of the first nuclear bombs. They were built in Los Alamos and Sandia Labs is where they did in Albuquerque, where they built the detonating device. And my grandfather worked for Sandia National Labs. So, you know, the thing was at that point in time when they did this, this was after, you know, in the, at the end of World War II, they started working, they started working on it before then, but um, it came to fruition at the end of World War II, and we dropped two bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So there's these two labs in, in New Mexico, one at Los Alamos where they're developing the bomb, Robert Oppenheimer, and then Sandia has another part of it. And they also worked at it uh, at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and stuff like that. As these scientists in these disparate locations were working on these, these bombs, if you wanted to get the data to sort of integrate this stuff, you traveled literally to that lab, right? And the computers at that point in time were just, I mean, they were really non-existent. You have in your hands today with this device, you have more computing power than existed in the entire world in like 1960. Right. more in, in your hand. Like he said, your phone is not a supercomputer. By 1960 standards, this is a supercomputer. So they started thinking, you know, like this is expensive. You had to store the data on computers, you know, in the early ages of computers. And then people had to travel or they had these huge computer uh, tapes. They, when they started saving it um, in, in more and more quantities, they had these big mainframes and they'd have these tapes and you'd actually have to transfer these tapes from location to location by, ma by mail, generally by U.S. mail. Or if it was classified, they would transfer it by um, government um, transport. The Cold War led to what was called ARPNET, the Advanced Research Project Agency Network. And the real, and that was sort of like a, you know, a, a connection of computers the real birth date of the internet is considered to be January 31st, 1983. That's when they developed a protocol, um, uh, transfer computer protocol, internet protocol, I think is what it stands for, TCPI, um, P, that allowed you to communicate with computers that may not be using exactly the same programs. But its usage was still really, really limited at that point in time. It was mostly a handful of government scientists working on 
top secret documents and things like that. And then it expanded to sort of the greater academic community. Again, people who, uh, who take the history of the internet very seriously would be horrified probably at my extraordinarily uh, abbreviated version of how this came about. Um, today, there are 4.95 billion users worldwide and 62.5% of the total world's population have had access to the internet. And that number is growing exponentially constantly, right? I mean, they're now setting up, one of the programs I used to play in my, my principles of marketing was a TED talk by a guy named Sagat Mitra, Mitra who talks about setting up the, the box in the wall. And he goes to these poor towns in India and he just sets up in these, these buildings, computers that are facing out and they have a keyboard on the outside and kids come by and they can start playing with the computer. Kids who have never seen a computer. He did those experiments. And before long, the kids are teaching other kids how to use the computer. And they're all sitting around and they're learning how to use the computer, right? More and more people are getting uh, access to the, the internet and computers, even in developing nations. So in terms of marketing, why do we have this explosive growth of the internet? Well, consumers have a desire to know. Aristotle says in one of his treaties on what it is we can know. So there are three great questions that philosophy attempts to answer. The question of knowledge, what is it we can know and how can we know it? The question of conduct, what constitutes ethical conduct, and then the question of governance. What is the best form of government that we can have? So the, the question of knowledge, people desire to know. Aristotle says, this is evidenced by the delight that man takes in his senses, particularly his eyes. Now, as I grade papers in my ethics class and others where I have essays on the exam, I oftentimes wonder not whether students actually have a desire to know, because when, you know, there's this fairly lengthy case study that I give you and I ask you for an essay response and like literally on the last set of essays I got just no like one word and I'm like no what there's like 15 questions you know then just no right oh, okay that's that's not gonna gonna cut it so I really really wonder but you do you do have a desire to know you want to know all kinds of things that's why you all spend an inordinate amount of time and you all probably do this with your friends and I have friends and we finally had to start saying things like leave your phones in the car when we go out to dinner because it's annoying because somebody will say something and say they'll start googling it instantly looking for the answer to see or to challenge whether or not somebody's right it's like like just be here in the moment for five minutes people can we just not do this but we all have this desire to know <clears throat> from 1800 to 1900 the sum total of human knowledge doubled once before that, if we went back in time, I mean, we can go back and I can't remember which historian did this, but he sort of identified the last person on earth who know everything that was known at that period of time. Possible. Something like recorded history to basically the Middle Ages, knowledge only doubled twice. By the mid 2000s, knowledge was doubling, total of human knowledge was doubling every 13 months. In 1945, the average doubling was 25 years. Now, it's estimated by some that the total sum of human knowledge doubles every 12 hours. If you think about just COVID, it's remarkable how quickly they came out with a vaccine. Not just one vaccine, but three. Well, they've been doing research in that area like for a while. Now. I mean, it's not like they're like, oh crap, we need it. But think about this. When I was a kid growing up, I remember the first cases of what was then called, it was not called AIDS. They called it at, at the beginning GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. We still don't have 
a vaccine. But that's when they started for HIV. The research for vaccines was when they AIDS and all that. Well, I mean, we started, we, we cured polio long before that. I'm, I'm really rather glad we didn't have the internet when we were trying to cure polio because all of these anti vac like nobody would have gotten the shots, like, and we wouldn't have eradicated polio or some of these other things that, that we have. They, the amount of time we, we identified a specific virus and brought a vaccine to fruition was, was really incredible. And that's because we could have just this enormous power as a result of the sharing of knowledge and, and the internet in many respects to come up with stuff like this, right? The ability to engage in e-commerce is of course attractive to both consumers and marketers. So what are the objectives? What is it that we try to do with regard to integrating marketing communication and the web? How do we use this? And I'll give you a duck for your comments. I forgot. Um, how do we use the web as marketers? What are we using it for? Well, and again, these bullet points are not necessarily mutually exclusive categories. And when we go back to the early parts of the web, like the year 2000, I remember I was vice mayor in the year 2000 and they thought all the computers were gonna crash and stuff like that. We had the internet back then. Mostly it was like static stuff. You just looked up and it was you know, not terribly interactive, but it can create awareness. We can, we can launch new products and we can create awareness through the web very easily. Historically, this was expensive, particularly when you talk about consumer packaged goods because Manufacturers had to get their products in front of consumers. And the way they did that in the age of television and radio was to get on uh, the television. And that was really expensive. And so a lot, it prevented a lot of companies from starting. Now we see all kinds of startups that got their awareness through just launching internet campaigns. Companies that have grown into being larger uh, companies than, than, you know, what we would have thought of things like Bombas and Tom's that engage in social entrepreneurship. You then can generate interest, provide information for your consumers, use it to craft an image. Internet marketing can help brand performance. Now, this is one of those areas where you have to be really careful because of the dynamic nature of the internet now. When it used to be static in the mid-2000s where the company controlled the message, now because we can engage in something called value co-creation, it's no longer just a one-way source of information. Historically speaking, and in the early ages of the internet, this was still true, companies provided information to consumers and consumers either had to take it at face value or not. Now, consumers can engage with the company. They can blog. Companies ask you to write reviews. Amazon used to have a program, I don't know if they still have it. If you wrote enough reviews, they would ask you to join what was called the Amazon Vine program, because what they recognized, and I don't think they, I don't know if they still have it, I haven't looked in a long time, but one of the things that happened was if you were asked to join Amazon Vine, you would get all kinds of free stuff. They would send you just all kinds of products to try. And there were rules. You had to agree not to sell the product. You had to agree to use the product and, and, and test it out and write reviews on it. But what Amazon started to recognize, and the reason they started this program, was that those people who wrote heavy reviews, products, even if they had bad reviews, sold more quickly than products that had no reviews on them because consumers want information. But if you do that and you allow people and you don't monitor it, you can get brand dilution <clears throat> because people can start posting all kinds of things. So it can help with brand image, but you have to be really careful because that image can be tarnished very easily by people posting stuff about you. It can simulate consumer trial of products. You can create buzz around a product. And it allows consumers easily to consider and evaluate alternatives. In the past, before the internet, if you were gonna consider alternatives, what did you have to do? Well, 
if you're going to buy a car, for example, now everybody gets on and what do you get? What do you look for? Well, you look for the Carfax. Historically, if you wanted to go buy a new car or even a used car and you were thinking about, you know, looking at things, you had to subscribe to something called Consumer Reports. And then you would go through the Consumer Reports and see what, what they said about cars. That took, and it, you know, I mean, it, it took a lot of space, these magazines that people get on Consumer Reports and things like that. Now, it allows us to do this in, in seconds and, and move on. E-commerce, the direct selling, one of the things that this has done is it allows for the disintermediation, even in the B2C model. So e-commerce from B2B uh, became really big, and then e-commerce from B2C now, and it has allowed for things that I never would have thought that you could buy direct from the manufacturer to be sold directly to consumers. When the internet first started and people started first buying stuff online from, from websites, again, that were mostly static and maybe just had a very simple order taking uh, page on their, their site that allowed you to place orders. I never would have thought that I would buy clothing online. I always thought that was something that you just had to try on because it all fits differently. By the way, sizes have, have changed, um, particularly with regard to women's sizes. Men's sizes are a little bit different because men's sizes are generally measured in terms of actual a circumference of the, the waist size, but women's sizes, I can't think are like, you know, five, seven, three. Um, what used to be a three in the 1950s is now like, they, they estimate it's now like a seven. And, and to, because people want to feel better about themselves, I guess. And so the sizes have actually gotten, with men's, again, it's a little bit harder because men's, it's generally like, it's the inseam length in terms, in the United States, in terms of inches and the circumference of your waist. However, they cheat on those as well to, to make you feel better. By, you know, I mean, if you try on two different jeans that are supposedly 32, you know, they've got ones now that the waistband stretches and how far it stretches can, can be a considerable amount. But it's a lot for the disintermediation. I never would have thought that I would buy clothes online, but now I buy a lot of my clothes online because it's easy to return. And if you find a manufacturer that you know how the sizes work, uh, and it's not a big deal, and it saves me from having to go to the mall or to the store and deal with the hordes and masses of people that are there coughing on me. One of the things, the other thing, another thing that's happened as a result of COVID is I think we've become more aware of like germs and, and things like that. People used to do this to me when I, when I was a younger professor, they'd come, when students actually used to come to my office, they don't anymore. They'd be like, ah, ah, I'm sick. I didn't want to come to class and then, oh, so you came to my very small office so that you could infect me. Like, no, stay away. People are actually, I think, now aware of things like that. So e-commerce sales are over 350 billion and it's only going to grow more and more. And it will allow for the disintermediation even more. Although we've seen, you know, there was this idea, again, scholars come up with these, these statements and they over- they overpromise on what they've got. Uh, there was a guy named Francis Fukuyama who called, he said that when the Soviet Union ended, it was going to be the end of history. That liberal democracy and capitalism had won and we were going to see the, the withering away of all other forms of governance and it would be the sort of the end of history. And boy, was he wrong, yeah. right? I mean... <laughs> Uh, Russia is no longer communist, but they certainly want to be a world power again. And they're certainly going to exercise, you know, uh, an attempt to regain what used to be the, the former Soviet socialist republics and, and their historic control over that. And communist China has not exactly gone away, although they're not very communist anymore, considering that the number one um, city in the world for billionaires is something like Hong Kong now. And that's a Chinese territory. So it's it's allowed for this, you know, and a lot of scholars said when this really became happening and people started buying clothes and things like that online, that we were going to see the total disintermediation of the market and middlemen would basically vanish. That hasn't happened. We've seen actually in many instances re-intermediation. Dell is a prime example of that. If you used to want a Dell, you either called up Dell and they built the computer for you. It was called mass customization and value co-creation. 
and they would ship it to you directly. Well, one of the things that we found out was that people actually want to go and touch the thing before they buy it, particularly with regard to laptops, because it's hard to know whether or not you can utilize, like how small can you get? I kind of have big, fat, chunky fingers. And so if I get like really, I've had a really small netbook and it's like, I can't type on this. My fingers are just too too big for this. So you, they actually want to talk, touch it. And so we've seen some re-intermediation in, in areas where it would have been surprising to think about. So the first decade of the web is what they called web 1.0, mainly static sites, one-way flow of information, limited use in terms of commerce. People basically went to the website, they found out information, and then they went to the brick store, the bricks and mortar store, and bought the product. Then we started seeing uh, you know, basic uh, commerce exchanges on the web, but still not dynamic. Then we get web 2.0, which allows for the dynamic exchange between consumers and producers so that we can talk, we can engage. And again, this idea of value co-creation where it's no longer and value co-creation allows for mass customization. It's no longer enough to just have this sort of idea of homogenization. In the early parts of the Industrial Revolution and the beginning of the 20th century, there was this idea that really the population was pretty homogenous and we could build things and we could sell it to these homogenized groups. And so we got things like small, medium and large, right? So there was small, medium and large shirts. Now, as we've gotten bigger, it's you know small, medium, large, extra large, extra, extra large, quadruple, extra large or whatever. But it was this idea that we could just come up with sort of three sizes and you would fit within some range of those three sizes. That's no longer the case. We want to have sort of this ability to have really unique products. Let's look at something. This is an example of... When I was a kid growing up, M&Ms were these, you know, hard chocolate candies with a shell and their motto was melts in your mouth, not in your hands. I can tell you as somebody who had really sweaty little hands as a kid that they will melt in your hands if you hold them long enough that, you know, they didn't melt in your hands like, like a, a Hershey's chocolate bar would, but they, they will melt in your hands. But I remember like when I was a little kid, there was the red M&M, that was a big deal. And then because red dye number something or other, which was the prominent red dye that they used to make M&Ms was found to be somewhat toxic. They pulled it and so it was hard to get red dye of anything. So there was no red. And then I remember when it was a big deal that the red M&M came back into being, well, now you can get all kinds of stuff. You no longer, M&Ms were just this hard shell candy that came in a... Um, cellophane packet. They were all the same size and, you know, they were like two ounces or something like that of these little hard candies. And that's the only way you could buy M&M's was in this little cellophane pack. It was brown. It had M&M's on the package. Now you can customize M&M's to get whatever you want. You can put your creepy picture on the M&M, right? You can have it in different tins. You can get it in a champagne bottle. You can get it in various different containers, all in different kinds of colors so that you can completely personalize. And the internet has largely allowed us to do this and to be very quick at, at this. And modern technology has allowed, oh, look, see really creepy pictures right there. That's like, why do you want your little pitched face? And I guess some people do. So what kinds of ads do we have on the internet? Well, there are different types and a lot of these have become really annoying. So banner, this is the most common. These are leaderboards, things that you see when you open up website on the sides or banner ads or at the bottom or maybe at the top. They can be static or animated. It's estimated that with these, when you put these out there on a site, that you get about a 1% response rate. Now that doesn't seem very good. They used to say 
that it, when you did a mass mailing and marketing, if you did a mass mailing to people, you would get about a one to two percent response rate. So if you sent out, you know, a thousand, you'd get, you know, one to two percent of that thousand. The thing that makes it really attractive with the internet. So you used to have to send out in mass mailings. You used to have to send out a massive amount. This cost a lot of money. So the mail service used to do something called bulk mail, where you would get a bulk mail permit from the from the post office. My mother's gallery in Santa Fe used to do this, and then you'd actually have to stamp. The, the, they'd give you a stamp with your bulk mail permit on it. You'd go down, you'd sign up for an account, and you'd actually have to stamp it on each piece of mail. And then the reason that they gave you this wonderful discount on the mails that you were sending out was because you had to go through and actually sort the mail yourself by zip codes. So you had to put the zip codes in, in bundles and then give them to the post office. So it, it saved them some sorting. They no longer do that because until Donald Trump's, you know, and this is not a political statement, statement of fact, until Donald Trump's postmaster decided to try and destroy, statement of fact, all of the optical scanners and all of the post office to slow down the delivery of the mail, particularly during the election season, it, you know, they, they no longer have to, this is no longer sorted by hand, right? The mail is sent through these scanners and it's read using an optical scanner. Again, this is what computer technology allows to, you to do. And it was very efficient and very fast. But you used to have to sort it yourself into zip codes and then take it down and they'd give you a discount. Well, that costs a lot of money. If you wanted to get a 1% response rate, you were sending out a thousand pieces of mail, it may not be worth it, right? For the amount of return that you were gonna get on that kind of investment. The thing about the internet that makes this really attractive is this is really cheap. 1% doesn't sound very good, but what's your potential of, it's not a thousand. It's, you can get reach millions of people in a very short period of time, depending on the website, right? Pop-ups, these are usually larger than banners. Consumers complain about these. How many of you hate pop-ups? I hate them, almost everybody. Almost everybody finds them annoying. 93% um, of respondents say they're annoying. So what's one of the problems here with pop-ups? Well, it can lead to, you know, a negative impression about your brand and brand dilution if people don't like it. If they feel like you're, you know, sort of annoying them while they're attempting to, as Alessandra Akisi says, play Angry Birds, right? You get Angry Birds for free. And why do you get to play Angry Birds? Well, there's all these ads and they pop up and they're annoying. Right? And they take more and more time. Interstitials, these are full page ads that appear while content is downloading. Again, um, people find these annoying and they can be blocked by pop-up blockers. But of course they write new code to come around and get around pop-up blockers all the time. Paid searches, as opposed to organic searches, Google is the number one dominant provider of these. So when you do a Google search, usually the top three, and it'll say ad sort of in the corner of the, of the top three searches. And you have to scroll down if you want to get the organic search. And then a lot of companies are using search engine optimization where you try to improve your volume of traffic through organic results. Now, that can be difficult to do, but there are firms that work on this specifically. Um, or you can just be really good at marketing and get, you know, sort of, I, I will tell you that my family's company through just sort of luck. And over time, if you type in Oklahoma's most haunted, we're always like, one of the first things that comes up on, on some magazine or, or ad um, in, in Oklahoma. That's because we've been on both Ghost Hunters and Ghost Adventures and the BBC and the New York Times. And so, you know, that's one way of optimizing is just to get enough, you know, actually good press. Yeah. So, uh, but there are now, you know, ways of actually doing this to try and get get pushed out using um, programs. Behavioral targeting. This uses data, again, big data, and IP information, your IP address, to get and target consumers. We saw huge amounts of this, particularly in political marketing. They are now micro-targeting. The Russians did this in both the 2016 and 2020 presidential election. They are able to micro-target at, at, at a really specific level with the internet. It used to be 
that the way we sort of targeted, if you went back again to like the 1960s or 70s, was you would look at demographic information and things like that. And then we got more sophisticated in terms of looking at psychographic information and being able to identify consumers. But that was all still like child's play compared to what you can do now. And one of the things that they can do is they can look at what it is you're clicking on and then actually uh, determine whether or not you are more or less likely to be persuaded by some kind of marketing appeal. Contextual ads, these are some, uh, I think, just from a prima facie perspective, some of the best ways that we use the internet. It is a natural congruence between sort of the website that you're looking at and the ad sponsor. So if you go to, and I was trying this last night just to see, if you go to things like Expedia.com, you'll see ads for Wyndham. Wyndham is a hotel group that has properties all over the world, or you'll see ads for Hilton, right? Those are congruent, like people are looking for travel. When they travel, they have to stay in hotels or vacation rentals or Airbnbs or whatever. And so those ads are highly congruent with the content. It's not just some kind of disparate thing that's being popped up and thrown in your face based on, on no um, sort of planning. It is actually within, you know, sort of usually if you do this correctly, within what people are automatically looking for. Rich media is media that uses a broad range of interactives, video, audio, and automation uh, in their advertising. And these, again, are not necessarily mutually exclusive categories. You can have you know, various overlay of these or combining of these. Online commercials, sometimes called pre-roll. They do this in television now as well. If you watch certain programs now, they integrate sort of the theme of the program into the advertising. The first one that I remember watching this was a with the, it, it was a show called Devious Maids, and they had the actual actresses using various products in ads that almost you would think like, what, is this still part of the show? Because you know they would that that were on that using like mops and stuff like that that people might want to try. Video on demand now includes ads. Again, in the past, when I was a kid growing up, the whole purpose of video on demand was you bought it and you didn't watch the, you didn't, you, you got it without, you know, ad content. But now they actually include ads in the video on demand, particularly if you want, um, you know, reduced rate or cheap, cheap uh, VOD. And then webisodes, which are short featured films actually produced by the advertiser, based on much like the infomercials of the 1990s that became so popular after midnight as people had insomnia and they were flipping through and they would sell juicers and all kinds of things or a QVC kind of promotional stuff, but on the web. IMC and social media. So Facebook, uh, over 2.5 billion users in 2017. That's increasing, obviously. That's an old, old number. It's the largest. There's also Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, Pinterest. And obviously these are really, really powerful for marketers to use. The thing I will tell you, and, and this is the thing, most of them and most of the textbook is written for large corporations. Most of you will probably not start out your career working for a large corporation. You'll start working for a entrepreneur or a mid-sized corporation here in Oklahoma or someplace close. For a lot of you, it seems to be that about 50% of our students, at least as I track sales students, about 50% of students want to stay somewhere in the area. And those that want to leave generally go all the way to Dallas. Wow, that's like, it's like just Baja, Oklahoma, right? And that's all Dallas is. It's just, it's the same city on a larger scale uh, as Oklahoma City. So, you know, you'll, you'll work for some mid-sized firm in, in this uh, for most of our students, and they won't use all of these. And the thing that I think is most important, and one of the things that I've told uh, my mother as we've moved into social media for her company and things like that, she hires these young people and they're like, well, let's get on Instagram and Snapchat and stuff like that. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, let's just wait. Because one of the things that can happen is if you don't dedicate yourself to monitoring it and looking at it, 
people become very annoyed with you. So I think you need to select, unless you're going to go to work for Ford, which will use everything and will hire an expert to do, you know, just that platform. You have to, you have to figure out what platform is most congruent with your product. And then you have to actually monitor it. And people get tired. They, they lose interest very quickly. If you're not posting on a regular basis, if you're not, if you're not replying to people, they get tired and they get bored and they, and they move on. So the challenge is to stay consistent in your message and to stay relevant. And that can be really, really difficult. The most successful companies in IMC have a consistent message. And because of the dynamic nature of social media and the internet, it can be very easy for you to get off message and to not be consistent. And then, of course, to stay relevant, you know, you have to use the site and actually engage with your, your customers. Sales promotions on the internet. We now, I, I used to know people when I was growing up who were extreme couponers. I have these friends, I'll use this term lightly. They're not really friends, they're acquaintances, I guess. They like were telling me all about how they walk out of the grocery store every week. They go shopping once a week. And usually they'll have, you know, between, they've got two little kids, uh, $300 worth of product that they paid $10 or less for because they'll, they'll go to double coupon days. And I'm just like, that's way too much effort, right? To go through and sort coupons. I mean, that's just like way too much, but it is easier on the internet now to look if you're going to go do something for a coupon to just get online and Google it and see if you can find coupons for digital coupons or promotional codes, things like that online. Also online sweepstakes. Personal selling. Since I teach personal selling and I'm one of the sales coaches and after this class, I'm going to go and we're going to run a sales competition here in Oklahoma City. For those of you who want to go and earn bonus points, I think I sent that out to you. The directions for the sales career fair. There's a lot of stuff there that's really interesting. I think that you should go and look at. It's an opportunity to talk to recruiters and have a, an ability to see um, some companies that are really, really interesting. One of the companies that we got at the last minute that I am really interested in is a company called Sazerac. They are a distiller of all kinds of spirits, which I appreciate because I'm a lawyer and lawyers like to drink until we have to go to whiskey school where they, they teach you to you know, change your playgrounds and your playmates. Whiskey school is code for the Betty. Betty is code for like, Betty Ford Clinic, where they drive people out, AA or whatever it is that you have to go through. So, <clears throat> so it's allowed for some decrease in sales force because we we have uh, been able to, to be more efficient, but it also can enhance and support the selling effort. And fundamentally, in particularly a business to business context, people really need that information. And one of the things that has happened with COVID that led to a, a, a real sort of downer in the sales was everybody just got really tired of Zoom meetings. And even though that this is a great tool and it allowed us to continue to, to operate in a time and in a climate, my sister-in-law, who's a drug rep for um, a, a major pharmaceutical company, and she also sells medical devices, you know, it allowed her to stay in contact with doctors when they were closing hospitals and not letting people in, but it, it you just can't get the same level of interaction as you can when you've got that human connection with somebody who's actually there and can show you the product and show you how it works, um, particularly with things like medical devices. So there are still limits to what we can do online, but it can be a powerful tool to enhance the selling effort. PR um, and the internet companies do this. They highlight their philanthropic activities on their web pages. Why? One of the things that we do know in the past that's different from your generation is that your generation is actually more concerned with companies that act ethically. It's one of the reasons why Tom's and Bombas and those are so, so successful because your generation actually likes to feel good about the things that they're using and the products that they are consuming. Unlike my mother's generation, which was pretty much just about, I want the cheapest product, you know, and I don't care if it was made in uh, a sweatshop in, uh, Kuala Lumpur or someplace like that. It also provides annual reports easily and corporate information. 
internet metrics that we can look at. These are examples. And one of the nice things about the internet is that we can monitor this. It used to be we would send out coupons in the mail and then we'd have to wait maybe a month or two or even longer to see how long it was before they were redeemed and what our success rate was. Now we can look, we can, we can look at the number of clicks that we get from a particular campaign. We can look at post, post click conversions. How many people click through? Lots of people click through and then they leave. Then something catches their eye and they're interested and then they leave. How many are we actually able to convert? What is the cost per, per conversion? How many unique visitors? These are people that are, are different, not the same person coming back over and over and over again to looking at how many unique visitors do we have? What's the frequency and frequency of conversion ratios that we have from these clicks? How much time are they spending? What's the exposure time? We can look at that. The ad interactive rate that we can look at. The view through rate, the number of visits. This one is really powerful. And when I was doing my PhD, we started looking at a lot of this, um, not with eye tracking, but some of the early studies on this were actually using fMRI technology to see what parts of the brain were functioning. Now we can look at and see what your eye is attracted to in the ad. What part of is it, is it that's catching and that is leading people to go ahead and click through and buy? We can look at if it has an offline sales lift and then the cross media models. All of these have advantages and disadvantages, but I will tell you that one of the things historically that we've said, this class used to be called just advertising. It was very difficult to determine the actual effectiveness or ROI of an ad. You might never know because people might not tell you or it was difficult to track. It is becoming increasingly easier to track. It's still not perfect. It's still not a one for one, but it is becoming a lot easier. We can do a lot more in terms of analysis of whether or not something's effective and, and looking at these kinds of metrics. All of them have their limitations again. If you look, for example, just at clicks, well, lots of people will click, or you don't know if they accidentally clicked through. They didn't intend to click. How many of you have done that? You've been looking at one thing and you accidentally, and then you've got some pop-up and it's blocked. It's got all kinds of stuff, right? So you don't really know if that's an intentional click, but if you look at a conversion, that helps. But they're, they're not perfect, but they are allowing us to be a lot better. Advantages of the internet and social media allows for micro-targeting now a highly tailored message. We're no longer just giving out a generic sort of message. We can tailor that message. And artificial intelligence is allowing us to do that with a great deal of precision. It provides a lot of information for consumers who want that kind of thing. Obviously, there's great sales potentials, creativity, speed, and we can change. Again, in the past, for non-brick-and-mortar Sales, it was either through personal selling, which was very expensive, or through catalogs. Once you printed the catalog, you were stuck with it for a given period of time, usually, you know, a season until the next catalog. We can like, oops, whoa, that, that's not working. We can change it really, really quickly. The disadvantages, there are measurement problems. There are measurement with all IMC stuff. We, it's not, it's not an absolute, you know, we can, we can tell with 100% certainty or precision. There's a lot of clutter out there. We are all now have been trained to be very uh, ADD in our attention span when using our social media and mobile media and online stuff. Because of the, of the nature of it, it changes quickly and our minds change quickly. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of clutter from an ethical perspective, there's a lot of potential for deception and misuse. Privacy, of course, is an, an issue. And then you can irritate people with it very quickly. So those are the disadvantages. I am out of time. I hope to see you all at the career fair tomorrow. If you have time, that's a good opportunity to get some valuable bonus points. All right. If you not have a good weekend and I will see you a week from today.